I'm absolutely delighted on your behalf and on behalf of GMCVO to um, welcome the, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. And we've, we've been joking really that we've only got such a great turnout because he's here to have the cakes after all. <laughs> um, but Andy's going to talk to us first of all about his vision for a more inclusive city region and the importance of a strong BCSE sector working in partnership. Um, after that, he will formally sign the accord and there will be some photographs being taken and then we'll, we'll give some time for questions and discussion after that if everybody's happy with that. Smile and nod. Okay, so I'm just going to invite Andy to speak. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Patsy, everybody uh, hear me okay? Good. Ball still awake? You got a long AGM? Yeah, a good one I hope. So uh, thank you uh, Patsy, thanks uh, Alex and all of you for having me uh, here uh, this afternoon. It's uh, about six months almost the day that I uh, took office as the first elected mayor of Greater Manchester. Feels a long time for me, maybe even longer for you, um, but really I'm only just getting going, we're only just getting going and I want to, uh, to talk about uh, all of that. Uh, this afternoon, but I can honestly say um, that in those six months there has not been one minute where I've sat there and thought, Do you know what, I wish I was back in Westminster, not, not one. <laughs> this is the future and we're building it together. We've recently uh, set out the vision um, for Greater Manchester going forward and as Patsy uh, said, it's a vision for inclus inclusivity, equality, diversity in everything that we uh, do and that's so you were there speaking at the launch of the strategy for community and voluntary sector in Greater Manchester and I think that itself sends a, a message about how we are going forward um, working with you as an equal partner uh, in everything that we, um, everything that we seek uh, to do. The, the simple uh, vision is of a Greater Manchester where no person, no place is left behind, where all children are supported, given the best start in life that we can possibly give them so that they fulfil uh, their potential, where everybody has uh, a decent, safe and affordable place to call home with nobody forced to sleep rough on our streets, where we have more secure and decently rewarded work um, and get rid of the, the culture of insecurity that has crept in uh, to, to the workplace and where we celebrate a positive vision of ageing um, where older people are valued for the contribution uh, that they can make. Now, you know, all of that sounds good, I hope we would all agree with it but I think there's, there's one thing that we need to kind of say at the outset uh, if any of this is to has me have meaning, real meaning. We will only achieve it if we make full use, full use of the best asset of Greater Manchester and that is its people. We've got to unlock the contribution of all of our people, all of our communities, if we're to achieve those, those goals uh, set out in the Greater Manchester strategy. And what I am certain of is that we won't do it if we stick to the old way of doing things, the old uh, politics, because um, quite frankly uh, it has given us many of the problems that we are dealing with uh, now. I spent 16 years in Westminster as you know, um, I think it's my summary of, of its uh, effect on the north of England is quite clear, Westminster has failed the north of England, it has given us a, a housing crisis. Uh, it has allowed a situation to develop where people live here in fear of eviction from one week to the next because we haven't properly regulated the private rented sector. It has allowed this uh, culture of insecurity in the workplace where some people, far too many people to be honest, here are going to work not knowing what they're going to earn from one week uh, to the next. How can that possibly be right? How can you build a, a, a strong home, uh, a strong community on that basis, you cannot, can you? Uh, and we are dealing uh, with that. And we have 
a situation where Westminster, in my view, going back decades actually, has failed at least, at least half of the young people of Greater Manchester by failing uh, to focus on them and obsessing on the university route and not thinking enough about young people who need support uh, to get technical uh, qualifications. You know, we, we in this room, all of you, are dealing with the consequences of these failures uh, from one week uh, to the next, and we aren't going to solve them by doing uh, more, uh, more, of the, um, more of the same. But it, it, it's almost worse than that as well. I mean, yeah, we're seeing um, all of the turbulence now in politics at a national level, not just here, but around uh, the world. But if you think of it in the UK context, I think the unhel unhealthy culture we have in Westminster is a product of the over-centralisation of power uh, there, the failure to share power uh, around the whole country. You know, we create a situation where there is too much of a kind of, uh, too many vested interests circling around that Westminster um, uh, uh, village and it creates that unhealthy uh, culture. It is a system, a centralised system, in which the London perspective on life dominates and that forms national policy. So consequently, many of our communities don't feel these answers were made with them in mind. It's simple, they weren't made with, with Lee in mind, with, with Middleton in mind. They weren't, they were made with the London perspective, the inside the M25 perspective in mind. So consequently, it's not a surprise, is it, that many people feel that the, the national system isn't giving answers that, that work, uh, work uh, for them. And you then kind of take it further. We've got the system of silo-based, the silo-based approach where Whitehall departments are kind of setting out what internally matters to them as though that's the tune that everybody should dance to rather than what matters to the communities uh, which we serve. And that creates a kind of a conflict of, of, of priorities. But also, it, it is a culture that's passed down from there, which is essentially distrustful of, of people and communities. You know, and the way in which public money is spent, there's almost a feeling, isn't there, that comes over from public bodies, that you know, they, they create all of this bureaucracy because they basically distrust uh, communities um, to, to be able to run things for themselves. And there's this kind of constant notion that money will be wasted were it to be given uh, to communities directly and they were to be empowered. And, and all of this is the product of the world in which we, we've all spent most of our, our lives in. And that's why today is such a joyous day, such a momentous uh, day. Uh, it's a day where Greater Manchester can honestly say that we're living up to what we claim to like, we like to do, which is to do things differently. Well, in the signing of this accord today, I think we're doing things spectacularly differently uh, to anywhere else in the country. Because at the heart of this, um, of this uh, accord is the notion that the community and voluntary sector will work as equal partners alongside the public sector, the private sector, in the delivery of the aims set out in the Greater Manchester Strategy. And it's important not to understate how important uh, that uh, that commitment uh, that commitment is. Uh, it will require everybody at every level to, to live and breathe the words of this document, to make sure they become a reality. And of course, it won't happen uh, overnight. We are trying to bring about a major change of, of culture and mindset here, so it will take time. But the very fact that we're we are signing uh, this uh, today, I think, is a real signifier of the change that is coming through uh, here in Greater Manchester. And I'm not going to stand here and claim ownership for it, even though it was in my manifesto. Uh, I was at a hustings in here, I like to think you remember it, and maybe other people in the room were there too, where I shamelessly pinched your manifesto, I think, that you were putting forward that day and said I would, I would commit to it. Well, I, I have committed to it, uh, but I didn't need to persuade anybody. You know, the Greater Manchester world is ready to embrace, at its heart, this idea that we don't write policies and do them to you, we write them together. This is your Greater Manchester as much as it's mine or anybody's. And this is a moment when we write its future uh, jointly together, where every single person here has an, has an equal stake uh, in the future of what we're, of what we're trying uh, to create. And by working in that way, by writing our plans together, I think we can be confident that they'll be so much stronger then as we move forward and there'll be much a 
greater sense of ownership in what in what we are what we are seeking uh, seeking to do. So it, it, it is a source of great pride to me that we are bringing through uh, this this accord. I'm will be won't be able to kind of ratify it for you today. We'll put it through our combined authority uh, later this month. But I'm here to say that in principle I support it and will be recommending it to the Greater Manchester Combined Authority at its um, at its meeting uh, next uh, next month. And I think it's absolutely critical if we are to deliver those key priorities that we've set out in the Greater Manchester uh, strategy. The idea going forward that everything can be solved by the old idea of producing a strategy document and then instructing public bodies to spend public money in a certain way, the idea that that will solve everything is, is outdated. If it was ever effective, it's certainly not uh, anymore. The only way we will do it is by unlocking the contribution that every sector can make. Uh, public, private, but crucially, community, voluntary, faith sector uh, as well. It's, it's all parts of Greater Manchester pulling together towards the same aim and that is the strength of that Greater Manchester strategy. For the first time it's trying to articulate those shared things that we should all commit to and say these are actually, at the end of the day, put aside all of the internal issues that we may face in our organisations, these are the things that matter in life, starting with children and school readiness. You know, it is a fact that of the 40 or so thousand uh, kids who arrive in reception class in Greater Manchester every year, uh, about a third, 12 to 13,000, are not school ready. Now, if, if any of us in this room believe in a more equal uh, Greater Manchester, then you have to do something about those figures. You have to get that 12,000 figure down uh, every year. And as Mayor, that's what I've said I want, uh, I want to do. And I know if we're going to do that, it's that old adage, I think Hillary Clinton first said, it takes a village to raise a child, and it certainly does. And it's about everybody uh, working to support people who might need extra help. I don't buy the narrative of troubled families, by the way. I think we have made life hard for those families, the ones I uh, mentioned who are struggling on a, on a zero hours contract or two or three part-time jobs. Who, have a private landlord who doesn't invest in the, the upkeep of the property so the kids are not in a, a decent and uh, good uh, environment. You know, that, they are coping with all of those, those issues and I don't think it, it is right for anyone to point the finger and say they're not investing as much time in their kids. You can't when you're doing uh, all of those, those jobs and facing all of the pressures that are loaded upon them. So we need to do better, don't we, to support them and, and provide extra help so that they can um, also uh, invest in their children and we can all uh, help build a Greater Manchester where every child arrives at school and is ready to learn and ready to fulfil their potential. On that foundation you build, in my view, a more equal Greater Manchester. Going forward from that, I do think we need to do more to equip our teenagers for what lies ahead. If you speak to any of them now, as I'm sure you all do, one thing comes back and back. You know, we need more life advice and support. We need a curriculum for life is what, they, is what they say and I think they're reflecting the fact that schools have increasingly been pushed down a route that makes them exam factories where it's only the test uh, that matters and I know certainly from speaking to my own kids and their friends they feel the pressure of that. They feel that kind of constant ratcheting up of the pressure and then there's the extra things that come with social media. I don't think we are in any way um, equipping our young people with the resilience that they will need to navigate an increasingly complex and, and insecure uh, world. If anything, and I hesitate to mention his name, but I will, Gove took us all backwards by kind of saying that Latin is more important than ICT and all the rest of it. It took the education system in completely the wrong direction, just when we should have been preparing young people for the modern economy. So again, if we want a great Manchester where nobody is left behind, where growth here is truly inclusive rather than exclusive, then you have to be sure at 16 that all young people leave school with a sense of purpose and a sense of hope for the future. And hand on heart, we can't say that today, can we? We cannot say that all young people come through Greater Manchester schools with that feeling. And I think we've got to change that. And it's why I'm saying that I commit to it again. It's important. I will provide free travel for 16 to 18 year olds. Why? Because I want to send a simple message to each and every one of them that Greater Manchester is theirs 
to explore, to own, to shape, to build. Every one of them are involved in this. There's something there for all of them at the end of school. And we are going to work hard to connect them with opportunity, opportunity to get on uh, in life. And that's another one of the priorities set out in the, uh, in the Greater Manchester uh, strategy. It does take us forward into the whole work I'm doing around, around homelessness. And in many ways, that presents something of a template for how the accord that we're signing today can come to life. Because we are writing our strategy to end rough sleeping in Greater Manchester with the voluntary sector. And we have been doing that from the very start through the Homelessness Action Network. I have always taken the view that the groups out there working day in and day out know more than I do in terms of what is needed and what is lacking. And that's why we did invite people in from the beginning to, to write this strategy with us uh, so that we, we get it right and we empower those who know what will make uh, a difference. But I want to take that principle and apply it further to all areas, uh, all areas of policy. But on that issue particularly, I think we also all know that if we are to, to develop a housing first model here that is, is about um, not just a revolving door where you give people temporary respite from the street, but you enable them to break out of the circumstances they're in. You have to provide the housing, but that extra support, that wider support, so that people can rebuild their social capital, their networks of friends, and, and, and develop a uh, new, uh, new life uh, and leaving the old one behind. That's what we've got to do. We can only do that working uh, with you and working with um, employers who will give people uh, those opportunities. And then going on to, um, to ageing, I think what we've got to think about is a greater Manchester model of public, of public service, where we take advantage of the big opportunity that devolution presents. And the big opportunity is to break down those Whitehall silos and to get out of that thinking where you've got the health service here that only deals with medical treatment and the social care system over here uh, dealing with, with people's care in the, in the home. You cannot look after people in the 21st century with a silo-based approach. You have to think about the whole person and start there and start in the home and build, uh, and build around them. A preventative, person-centred uh, model that, as I say, involves uh, families and communities uh, in as equal partners that sees carers rather than treating them as invisible, uh, unseen by the, by the system, that banishes use of the phrase bed blocker, which in many ways is a kind of product of this mindset that says it's the system that matters, not the individual. You know, that's the burden on the system. They're a problem for us because they get in the way of our system. That's what's got to change. And we've got to have a, a dialogue and a language uh, in Greater Manchester where every single person is valued, valued for the contribution that they can make, the contribution that they have made uh, in their life in building Greater Manchester uh, to what it is um, uh, today. So you can see where, where our thinking uh, is, is going. And I can say to, to all of you that I, I'm confident that this accord will be approved by the combined authority uh, later this month. Um, I have not to, had to persuade anybody to endorse uh, these principles. It builds on a, a concord that we've already signed uh, with the, the NHS. And it does, in my view, um, provide the foundation for us to build this different, this different way uh, of, of working. You know, we've got 16,000 at least organisations out there uh, doing the work uh, on the ground. And for too long, and I speak as somebody whose experience as a constituency MP of, of working on these issues, for too often battling against the system, and often supporting people who are battling against the system, trying to get uh, support. And I've always said, just imagine what those organisations could achieve if they were swimming with the tide, rather than feeling like they were, they were fighting uh, against it uh, all of the time. Well, we really are going to, to, to make that feel, uh, feel uh, real. And I'm quite happy for you to write down my words today and replay them to me in a couple of years' time. Because if, if it doesn't feel like that, then I will have failed and I won't have delivered what I said uh, I, would, I would do. I want to, to get this right. I was asked by 
uh, Alex and, and others on your behalf recently to, to give a political lead uh, to this whole whole drive, to make sure that the Accord has a, has a point of political uh, accountability. So I can say today that I've asked Kieran Quinn, uh, leader of uh, Tameside Council, who leads for the combined authority on finance investment, to add the community, voluntary and cooperative sector to his brief, and that will be explicit within uh, Kieran's brief, and he has uh, uh, very enthusiastically uh, taken that on board. So Kieran is there to be an advocate uh, for, for you in everything uh, that, we, uh, that we do. He will ensure that the principle at the heart of this, that relationship of trust, between the public and community and voluntary sector is, is, is honoured uh, in, what, um, in what we uh, do and there'll be new standards of working in terms of the governance, in the way that we, we uh, work with you and involve you. And critically, and this is for me the critical bit, I said it at the hustings and I stand here again today and say it, you know, at the heart of this is a commitment to move away from that frustrating and distracting approach of making the community and voluntary sector bid for project-based funding, annual funding, that culture of distrust I was talking about before, that's, that's what it leads to, isn't it? An approach where you're always being asked to jump through uh, new hoops to try and access the support that you need. We want to move from that towards long-term core funding uh, for our voluntary and community organisations across Greater Manchester because in that way we believe by giving you that stability, by taking away the annual scrabble for funds, we'll get the most from you in terms of building for the future and becoming a full partner in terms of how we, how we deliver things. Now of course it won't all happen tomorrow, it will have to be worked at, but at least here you have a piece of paper that you can take to all of those discussions that you can reference then in, in any uh, in any um, uh, uh, discussion with commissioners uh, across across all of Greater Manchester, and um, we will also uh, work to develop with you a, a VCSE action plan and provide more capacity building in future, so that organisations can grow and develop in the way in the way that you uh, want to. So, I'll, I'll finish really on on on, on this point. Um, I think it is a moment of. Uh, great flux really, turbulence in the way uh, things are developing in the country, and uncertainty. But what I also sense is some buy-in really to what we're trying to do, to do here. It's not about, as I say, the old way of doing things, the top-down way. I want to sweep that away and break things open and make this a moment where change feels real to you, re feels tangible. That, you know, for me, that's the, the only point of devolution. You know, to do the old things through new structures would be to miss the point in a quite major way. And I'm determined not uh, to, let that, uh, to let that happen. This is a moment to kind of change the way we do things. It's a, a kind of feeling that, that's there, it's palpable, it's out there. People want something different. They want a different way of being, of being involved. And I think we can, we can pave the way here. Because in Greater Manchester, we have a more powerful devolution deal than anywhere in the country. And there are a lot of eyes on us to see whether or not we can rise uh, to this challenge. I have no doubt at all when I look at all of you today that I see people in this room who are ready to rise to that uh, challenge with me, to make use of this opportunity that we've got, uh, we've got before us. And by doing that, kind of show a different way of doing things, to make this drive for devolution permanent and to then make it go faster, further and deeper uh, right across the country. Because I think that's what we've need, we need. We've hit this point in our national life when we really need to see uh, power and resources more, more fairly shared and in the hands of the many and not in the hands of the few. And if anywhere can do it, then, then we can do it. If you look back in our history, Greater Manchester has always been a social disruptor, an innovator has kind of stood up against the status quo and said there is a better, fairer way of doing things. Next year, 100 years of women being given the right to vote, a campaign that grew out of here, this very place where we are, just a few streets from, from where we are. Next year also, 150 years of the trade union movement uh, founded uh, in the centre, in the centre of town, the cooperative movement. We've always innovated in the interests of the underdog 
and stood up to the status quo, to the establishment, and said, you know, things can be better than they are. And I think this is a moment to do it again. Things can be better uh, than they are. And the more that we come together through this whole movement that we're creating, the, the louder that, that call for change uh, will be, and the more irreversible we will make this process of devolution. So I've said before, we have in our past uh, changed the world, and now is the time for Greater Manchester to come forward and change the world for the better all over again. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. I look forward to you. Um, well, thank you for what you said about um, living wage uh, accreditation and applying for it. I can actually confirm we've got it, actually. We've just been given a living wage uh, employer status. And the aim, of course, is to um, use that then to encourage others to, to follow suit. So I'm led to believe that GMP feel, I think, that they, they could already apply, I think. But uh, you know, that's, I think there's some work being done just to, to, to check. Uh, completely, but it's the direction of travel. Um, I think Salford have already uh, become our th first council, I think, to, to have living wage uh, employer status. So it, it's a it's a, a movement that we want to build uh, as part of a Greater Manchester Employers Charter, a GM Good Employers Standard. So uh, Sir Richard Lees is working on that uh, with me to see if we can develop a set of principles that cover not just income but also job security, um, flexibility in terms of um, work, uh, pay gap, gender pay gap, you know, a whole range of things. So uh, it, it's on its own, living wage is important, but it will also be followed by a broader range of uh, measures with relation to, um, to good employment. And on the, um, the, 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 yeah, the, like anything, I'm sure you're not perfect, are you? So um, there are things in, ways in which um, possibly can change. I have observed at times that the, the voluntary and community sector can be as competitive as the private sector uh, at times, if that's a controversial thing to say, but, but it's true. Um, you know, I don't think, you, you would expect higher levels of collaboration, but it's not always uh, true. And what I think we've managed to achieve through the Homelessness Action Network is a sense of a, a, a sector that collaborates together. So is isn't, you know, is, filling the gaps where there are gaps, rather than kind of competing for what each other can do. And I think that is not a bad principle to see how can we build a kind of an ecosystem here that supports every organisation and recognises that everyone's got a contribution uh, to make, but it's better at saying you're better off making that contribution in that particular space because that's where we are, we don't have um, capacity. And so I hope that answers the question, I hope it's not too provocative, but I think, you know, we possibly in the kind of public sector side, haven't created the conditions where the, um, the, the um, VCSE has been able to, um, uh, to, to collaborate. You know, the, the nature of that annual funding, that project funding, has created that competitive uh, culture. So I'd be the first to acknowledge that. But I think there's a chance here to move away from that and move towards much higher degrees of collaboration than perhaps we've seen before. Yeah. I'll take, I'll take three so we can get around everybody. In. I think it's a transport question, Andrew. <laughs> um, Community Rail has been given quite some funding from the Department of Transport to provide a sort of third sector feel to the rail industry. Um, this morning, um, morning people about the latest strike um, in Gosland Train. Um, I found a passenger in tears who said that her employer, who's a high street bank, 
struggling to sack her because she can't get to work on time. Um, that seems fairly awful. Um, so what can we do to improve transport so it doesn't affect people's work, work prospects? Yep. Should, should say them in three so we can get more. Yeah, I was building on the earlier questions. Gavin McGregor from Lloyds Bank Foundation. Um, just thinking about the impact on smaller and medium sized charities uh, over the last few years who have been particularly affected by a decline in income and the sort of commissioning environment that uh, small and medium sized fa uh, charities find themselves trying to win those kinds of contracts. And this pres presumably uh, presents a real opportunity to try and address that to allow them to actually flourish. Thank you. Should I take one more? Uh, there was a question in front there. Yeah. Sorry. Hello. Hi, my name is Pretty Bottom from Big Life. Um, it's similar to the previous question, really. Um, is that, you know, we, I work in an organisation that's one of the biggest social enterprises in Manchester and have been around for 25 years plus. One of the biggest issues is whilst we absolutely embrace what you're saying, but localised commissioning within the 10 local authorities still control the procurement. And what it feels like is that everything is going back in-house. And the trust issues, not just trust, but you know, the third sector are absolute experts in transformational change. So you really need to utilise that and our ability to Say, for example, um, reduce clinical intervention and put in place skilled staff that can do those, um, offer those services and interventions. But the key thing is, is whilst that ambition is there, how are we physically going to ensure that we are able to compete within the procurement rounds that uh, from the 10 local authorities? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. All three are good. Um, so on transport, I think you're absolutely right to identify this as a major barrier that stands in the way of a uh, lot of people in Greater Manchester accessing the opportunities that they they need. And I, I mentioned it in the context of younger people, 16 to 18 year olds, I haven't got unlimited resources, that's why I am focusing there because that's such a critical, critical moment when they need support. But it, the same could be said for people of all ages, to be honest, because we've had a, a public transport system here for 30 years that's been running the private rather than the public interest um, and the whole bus deregulation experiment has been a disaster actually for us. Um, it's led to a free-for-all, higher prices, poorer services, um, some places no service at all. Um, it hasn't worked. So we have new powers and bear in mind that bus, bus services are the backbone of the public transport system. We have new powers to re-regulate the buses and um, <coughs> you'll see in 2018 that will become a very big focus of my, my work. It's a big job to be done there uh, and it needs to be done um, so that we have a, a system that prioritises the public interest and where the public interest dictates what kind of buses and what kind of services and which places they go to and what ticket structure they offer is, is, is basically laid out and laid out very, very clearly. Um, that, that's, that's coming um, and obviously we want it then to integrate with Metrolink. The reason why we can't have a London style oyster system where there's a daily cap on what people ha can pay is because of that reason about the buses, they don't integrate, you know, they're doing their own thing, all of them, so they can't, we can't integrate this system. Everyone says, well why have you got this? It's a simple, simple thing. London never had deregulation, we did and the difference is, is pretty clear. So, you know, we've got to move back in that direction, but I am kind of looking at a bus system that integrates with Metrolink that, you know, brings in the idea of daily caps and these kind of things to, to help make transport work for people uh, again, rather than for profit. Um, in terms of the commissioning environment, uh, well, you're, you're absolutely right. This is a changing picture as well, isn't it? The integration, when we talk about integration, it's not just in terms of the delivery of services. There is a growing move towards integrating commissioning uh, budgets. And that is work in progress. It's obviously a journey that's by no means ended. But the aspiration will be at GM level to move increasingly to a single commissioning voice. 
And the thing about that, of course, is it, it then, I think, will prioritise different decisions. You know, when, you, when the savings all come back to the same pot, I think it will, it will move us away from people saying, well, we're not paying for that if they benefit, and all, you know, those old kind of art, stale arguments, to be honest, that you get in the, in the public sector. I think when you have more clarity in terms of commissioning and, and, the, and the, the things that we're prioritising through devolution, such as school readiness, as I said, for life readiness at 16, you know, tackling kind of families in crisis and homelessness, positive ageing. I think you know, you'll, we're hoping in time to bring through more consistency in terms of commissioning, commissioning priorities, and therefore a, a better landscape for organisations big and small. Here's a, you know, I, I, this is a controversial point that goes back to the first question. Should I prioritise GM-based organisations for, um, you know, for, for in, the, in the commissioning process, given that if the organisation is based here and the volunteers are all drawn from here, theory will be that that will deliver more back to the to the, the, the GM body politic or you know the, 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 the wider common good. So I'm open to these kind of things, you know, in terms of how we might construct a commissioning environment that that really gets it right um, in terms of its principles. But you know that's a discussion to be to be had going going forward. And I don't want to rule out organisations, but I am I am aware and I have seen larger national organisations move in and try and undermine contracts or try and take over contracts and damage what can often be highly successful and really rooted local organisations and you know that is a kind of behaviour I, I, I really don't want to see and I would want to create a commissioning environment that, that minimises the chances of it of it happening. I take your point, I mean, you know, all, all of you will say well I like these words but it's the reality is something different I, and I hear absolutely what you are uh, what you are saying. The trick will be not me, not in just me kind of saying to somebody, oh, you must do this or you must commission in this way rather than the way you've been doing it. It's more in getting the vision right, isn't it, for what we want to achieve through our strategy for public services and particularly the NHS going forward. So I've long argued for a fully integrated system that is about the person, not the patient. And if you think in that way about the person and not the patient, I think it takes your mindset when it comes to commissioning to a totally different place. If you're thinking of the NHS as a medical treatment model where everyone's a patient, I don't think you do necessarily think about the, vo the, pri the voluntary sector. You think about um, you, you think about hospital beds and you know appointments. And but if you start thinking about promoting health and well-being in its broadest sense, then inevitably you start thinking, well, what's the best way of doing that? And the voluntary sector then becomes a much a much more um, significant player. A couple of specifics. We are looking very seriously at the idea of social prescribing. So how do we have a system in primary care that means you're as likely to leave your GP with a, an offer of exercise referral or bereavement counselling or debt advice as instantly as access to medication? You know, can, can we create that? And if we were to create a structured system of social prescribing in Greater Manchester, then I think the opportunities for the organisations in this room are significant. Um, and obviously there's a budget there in terms of not just spending money on medication, but spending money on community capacity. The other thing I would just point to you is, is a move that we are asking for the government, permission for the government uh, to make, which is to break out of the activity-based tariff in the NHS. Because at the moment, if you think about it, we have a, a kind of an approach to health and care that underfunds the council bit of care, so you get this 15 minute visit culture, which as we all know, doesn't stop people from going into hospital if they're at risk of going into hospital. And then it spends thousands of pounds keeping people in a hospital bed for weeks on end because hospitals are paid by every person who comes through the door. That's how the system works. And what we're saying is, if we broke out of that and moved more towards a year of care approach, where we consolidate funding, primary care, social care, acute care funding for individuals within the community most at risk of hospitalisation, we think the incentive would, would switch from allowing people to drift into a hospital bed and actually would, would move to supporting them preventatively in the home because the financial incentive would, would kind of ask people to do that. So it's, it's about, make, it, for me, it's about not just asking the, the current, not just within the current way of doing things, asking people to commission differently, You've basically got to kind of completely recast the whole kind of thing that you're trying to trying to achieve. And if you do do that, 
on any basis, there's got to be a bigger role for the community and voluntary sector. Three more? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sonia, I'm from Kalisa, we're a social justice charity in London and in Greater Manchester and we work with disadvantaged young uh, people in schools, prisons and the community. Um, I love listening to what you uh, shared about uh, your, and your passion was really evident for young people. Um, I guess my question would be how do you feel about the rise in school exclusions and what do you think needs to be done about it um, in an ideal Greater Manchester? What would that look, actually look like? Really good. So there, was one, uh, there was one there, I was going to point to that label. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I perhaps don't need that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm interested in what you said very early on about the small children. Now, for my money, you should be concentrating. If you've only one dollar of money, it should all go on reviving Sure Start. Because if we have the children school ready, then the teachers and everybody involved throughout the whole of the system will be able to do and produce and do better. And then at 16, you won't have those problems. And we may not have so many problems as that lady has just raised about uh, children excluded and so on. But I'm here today, I discover, I didn't know who I was representing, but it turned out <laughs> I'm representing time out for carers. So, sort out the children and the beginning. But I think your big problem as the years go on is going to be the old people. Now we are trying with ambition for ageing, we are doing things, but the large number of care homes that are questionable, the large number of people who are in their own homes not adequately helped by the carer system, that's a tremendous problem and it's growing. And that's going to be your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, fear it, I fear it already is, actually. <laughs> Sorry, the hand at the back there. If I can do another round quickly, I'm being told this is the last one, but if I can squeeze another round in, because I know there was a lady there and uh, a couple more there. So I'll try and give quick answers and then um, get a few more in. Hi, uh, the mayoral election was the first election I had missed because I fell off my bike on the towpath broke my shoulder. Oh, okay. um, so my question is not about my work, it's about um, cycling really, and it's just about how we can move from getting people off cycling on the top path and on the Falkyrie Loop where people are being mugged and look at the main arteries and turn ourselves into a proper sustainable city where actually we see hordes of cyclists like you do in London. Um, I know you can't get rid of the hills and the rain, <laughs> but there are some, some things that we could do to, so that the, the cyclists feel a bit more like kings of the road rather than the paupers of the poopy toe pad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good quote there. <laughs> um, right, there are three really good questions. Um, yeah, the, the, the frustration, if I'm honest, is the way education policy has gone, and I kind of hinted at this in my opening remarks, I'm more than hinted at it, you know, it's kind of gone in the wrong direction. Um, it's gone in the wrong direction in terms of the curriculum. I think those exclusions are more likely because you've got a curriculum designed for some children, not all children, and it's a very elitist academic uh, approach. And so more and more kids will get disengaged when they get into their middle teenage years. They can't see where school is taking them. That is a problem, a real big problem. The other problem, of course, is that devolution, they're not part of it. You know, the schools are kind of deliberately being, you know, the, the, the logic of the reforms that we've had in education are to create schools as fiefdoms, you know, out, broken from their council, kind of not, I would say, accountable enough to their, to their communities. So that then gives us a problem when it comes to exclusions because, you know, if the head teacher is judge and jury over whether or not someone stays in school and that head teacher is judged on the A to C's and the, the academic kids, well, he will he or she will not have a, an incentive necessarily to, well, to have a, a very inclusive approach to, to, to that whole issue. And I think that's you know, what, what you're picking up. And it's a similar thing when I was talking about curriculum for life. You know, young people are feeling this. They're feeling that some of them at the school's not being run for them. And it's not giving them what they, what they need. But to their credit, many of our schools 
in Greater Manchester get this, and they're, they're as frustrated as we are. And I think what we've got to try and do is engage them in a different conversation. So through what we can do, you know, obviously the mayor doesn't always need power to instruct, you know, we just get them around the table and start to, we are talking about a Greater Manchester curriculum for life. So how can we provide support at a GM level that can go into schools and then deliver that other stuff around financial literacy, um, health advice, um, you know, relationships advice, you know, how can we kind of take stuff to them that helps them deliver that broader um, uh, life curriculum. And we are very much on with that. That's a, you know, a very, a very active work stream. You know, I don't know if you all watch Educating Greater Manchester. Um, amazing school, I, I mean, you know, Harrop Fold, fantastic school, real challenges. But you know, to his great credit, Drew Povey, the head, has a policy of no exclusions. You know, and particularly given the challenges that, that they face, I think that is so commendable. And, um, you know, I think it's, a, it's about what I was saying before, again, in terms of competition, collaboration. Schools have been forced down this route of false competition. They'd be so much better if they all supported each other, and particularly managed exclusions together. And, uh, you know, that, that is the kind of, you know, but, but if I'm being honest with you, we're some way before we're, you know, that, at that point with them. You know, they are a bit not in this conversation at the moment. We need to bring them into this conversation and let them feel part of devolution too. So we're, we're, we're beginning that discussion, but you know, there's some way to go on it, but we'd, we'd want to, um, to, to involve you with it. We're going to have an event at some point on life readiness, you know, where we really kind of get all the players together. We've done it already on school readiness, and then we're going to kind of move the conversation on. Because that picks them up on your, your point, a really strong one, but this is the logic of what we're saying. If the kids are not school ready, they're not going to achieve, are they, at 16? And then, yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, and it's, yes, it is sure start, but sure start refocused, I would say, because sure start in the end sometimes became a place for the parents who already had a lot of support to kind of, you, you know, they, they, they often were kind of for the more connected. And, um, and what we need to ensure is that our efforts are focused on those who most need, uh, most need the support. But we've chosen this thing of school readiness rather than early intervention, because it then bridges the divide between the council and the NHS 0 to 4 and then the primary school 4 onwards. So what we're trying to do is get everybody around the same shared objectives. That's the, that's the idea of the Greater Manchester strategy. You know, we pitch our priorities in a place where everyone can feel they can buy into what we're saying and we get rid of the kind of, you know, the different priorities in different organisations. On care, you're at, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, that is the big, the big issue. I've, you, you, people may know I've long argued for a very different approach to the funding of social care and I still remain of the view that it, it should be funded on the NHS principle where everyone is covered, everyone contributes but everybody is covered. Um, but it's, it's, it's in the context of a very different system that is, as I was saying a moment ago, person-centred and preventative and starts with quality in the home and actually eradicates this awful culture of 15 minute visits by staff who aren't properly trained. How are, you, how are we ever going to rise to the challenge of the ageing society on that basis? Well, we're not, are we? You know, I think we need to start to think about guarantees, citizen guarantees when it comes to health and care. So the carer who you're representing today, too often, as I said, invisible to the system, taken for granted, should actually, the reverse should happen. They should be at the heart of the system and the carer should be given one person to call for the coordination of all care. Not tell the same story to everyone who comes through the door and no one puts the whole picture together. Because actually if you, if you give the carer what they really need, you will make it easier for them to be a carer and then provide that voluntary contribution to the care of their loved one. At the moment, we leave them coping with too much and then they can't cope and that person, the, the loved one may go into a home or into a hospital. So it's a classic example why we don't spend a few pounds well to save a few pounds uh, later down the line. So we are much further ahead in our thinking on this than anywhere else in the country. And what we've got to try and prove is a different and better way of doing things, even within what is probably going to be a pretty challenging financial environment uh, for some time, for some time to come. So it, I wouldn't want to underestimate this and it's all going to be utopia and it's all going to be easy. It's definitely not. But I think if we, if we move the system in the direction that we're talking about, I think we'll, we'll sustain things in a way that other areas will, will struggle. And you know, we will probably relieve pressure on our acute system in a way that other areas won't and the hospitals will really collapse under the, 
under the weight of what they're being asked to do. So it's you know it's a really big challenge, as you correctly um, correctly say. But we're on we're, we're on with it, and I think we're better placed here to, to make a success of it than than anywhere. But a, partly part of it as well, of course, is helping people get physically active uh, and getting people out of their cars onto onto their bikes. Um, Absolutely, it's why we asked Chris Boardman to be um, the GM Cycling and Walking Commissioner. Uh, so Chris is is on with his work. Um, he's no nonsense. You know, he's, he's, I can assure you that what was it, Pooey Towpath or whatever you call it, or not uh, not his. Uh... He was riding the sidewalk around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he's got higher ambitions than you know than, than that, and I think you know it's. Um, it's, it's, it's a change that we need to make because it makes sense on every level, doesn't it? Congestion, everyone feels it. Uh, climate change gets worse, you know, and where's our contribution to that in terms of GM? Um, health, just talking about that. It's an investment for the future, isn't it? To, to create a high quality, dedicated cycle uh, network. You know, you look at Oxford Road, okay, it's only a small bit of GM, but it kind of points the way to a much better way of doing things, separate, safe space for cyclists should be, I love your thing, King of the Road, yeah, that's what it should be, you know, it's, and London has proved, if you build it, people will do it. Um, so Chris is putting a big challenge to us in terms of the investment that he wants to see, and we're looking at how we can, how we can do it, but cycling is a massive part of our agenda. I'm going to look that now, so I'll take three more, then I'll finish, that's okay. So yeah, gentlemen there, and then a couple more, a lady there, I promise there. Uh, hi, Andy. Mark Lee from the Together Trust. Um, I accosted you once on a train coming up from London just to congratulate you on the support you gave to the Hillsborough families. Um, I know you're a lifelong Evertonian, so you clearly demonstrate the support for the underdog. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, In the DNA. <laughs> what, what I did want to ask you, though, was the importance of leadership and boards to enable organisations to perform to their best and to be high quality but also to enable them to collaborate more effectively. Sometimes that attention to, to competition gets in the way of the collaboration side. And I'm just wondering what the nature of influence you see that those individual boards, those individual managers and leaders can bring to bear on that sort of agenda. Okay, thank you. So I did promise the lady there, sorry. I'm going to give the last question to the star of Granada Reports. Hi, Diana. Hi, Diana. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, a small simple question, actually. What I'm going to say to you is you sat here. For those of you who don't know me, Dark Scott is a complex needs and all the young people and families we work with. How do we make sure this plan, our people, our place, and chose children and young people like Amber have a good life? And Greater Manchester is the best place for them to live, as in they can get about. I don't need to say anything on that. She's got entire book. <laughs> she definitely has. You know, yeah. they can For those who didn't see, she was on Grand Reports last night and she was fantastic, wasn't she? Yeah. And the response was brilliant. You know, but how does she have opportunity to a job? How do her friends have opportunity to a job? They're ready to leave school. They've got access to a home. They can go out. They've got social care that supports them to live lives as independent members of our community with a lot to offer. Not going into homes and group homes, lives they want to live. How do we, in five years time, I would stay here with her and say, Great Manchester is the best place to live as a young person with special educational needs and disabilities. Well said, fantastic. <laughs> On the first question, I think a lot of it is about leadership, isn't it? And capacity. And I mentioned towards the end of what I said at the beginning about the GMCA helping build capacity and leadership. 
I'm beginning to think about you know leadership in the public sector. So, you know, really kind of helping people understand this agenda in the middle management of the public sector, so that they can then embrace it and put it into practice. But I think we should be thinking about maybe expanding that to the community voluntary sector as well. That you know we kind of we develop a Greater Manchester way in terms of how we want services to work. And I'm going to come on to what Diane was just saying there about you know truly person-centred services, and then kind of equip them to then deliver that um, through through what they what they do. So I'm open to ideas there in terms of how we might boost that capacity and and and, uh, and help people with that that leadership that, that leadership role. But we've got some outstanding leaders, haven't we? We've got some incredibly inspirational people in this in this sector and um, yeah we've got to use them to the to the full and that's the whole logic of, of what we're um, of what we're doing uh, doing today on the point about cohesion I mean you're absolutely right I, I can, you're going through that mayoral election I remember speaking to you as, as part of it it came over to me just how fragmented this this place is to be honest and while we rightly pat ourselves on the back for so many of the things that we're doing, and I, and, I, and I do that as well, and we all do. We've got to be honest as well at times where things aren't what we would want them to be. And I think in this area of uh, fragmentation and lack of cohesion, there are many young people here growing up and they don't really leave the community where they, where they are. They don't see how they can, you know, they are in that world. And I don't think, you know, they don't have a sense of, of hope or, or or purpose. They don't feel they can come and work in the city centre because of the cost of the bus fares and travel. So it's it's a picture that I think when you go around as I did and you really see it and you really listen, you kind of find that it's it's not as um, cohesive uh, as we would any of us would want it uh, to be. Um, coming out of obviously the terrible events at the arena, I asked Rishi Shorey, leader of Berry Council, together with Jean Stretton, leader of Oldham Council to lead a commission on both promoting social cohesion but also tackling violent extremism. Uh, and that commission has now met and is really beginning to do its work. It's, I was at its first meeting and it received a presentation on inequality in Greater Manchester done by the team at the GMCA. And what you actually look at, and I'd be happy to share this picture with you, when you do a deep dive into it in terms of not just a borough level but deeper down into some communities, you really see the full the, the full picture of how unequal uh, we are. And I think you have to start there because extremists in any community feed on that, don't they? You know, you're not getting on because it's your name, is, they, they do you down because of your name or they do you down because someone else has got your job. And that, they feed on that, don't they? That's how they, that's how they work. Um, and I want this commission to really focus on, on that around the sense of shared future of opportunity, you know, really building cohesion and empowering all communities to tackle the extremism that is a facet of our times in all communities together. You know, how do we unite the kind of mainstream of all communities to promote cohesion and, and, and um, uh, stand against hate and, and extremism? And it is linked, of course, to a, a zero tolerance of, of hate crime of, of any kind. Uh, and uh, that's what we stand for uh, here. You know, I think the positive is that though hate crime did increase after the attack, I've been obviously travelling around since, since that time in terms of the different events I've been to in London and around the world. People got a sense of this place, you know, after, after the attack. They did, and those who knew it kind of, kind of were reinforced in what they thought about Greater Manchester, but others felt it for the first time. And in, even though it you know, was in the worst of times, we definitely saw the best of people. And I think that came over, and what it tells me is there is something truly valuable here on which we're building in terms of that spirit of solidarity that, that, that we've got. So we've got the ingredients, it's just a case of kind of working with them and, and unlocking that, 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 um, that community spirit uh, even more. But the Commission is looking at that, so I would encourage all of you to feed into it. You know, it's an important piece of work. You know, if you haven't got the trust of communities and families at that very basic level, then we will never promote cohesion and we will never um, challenge some of the, the, the hate that's, that's, that's out there. If young people don't have a feeling that, that there's a future for them at the end of school, then we're already on the back foot when it comes to tackling discrimination and hate. Um, so 
big challenges, but they do knit into the other things that I've, that I've said, and I really would encourage everybody to engage with, with Rishi's Commission, because I, I personally see it as such a crucial part of our recovery from what happened uh, in, in May. We've got to be prepared to ask some tough questions of ourselves in terms of the inequality that we've got here, the way in which we are tackling extremism or not, and, and then move forward together. Because we've got to really make it a moment when we, you know, we really do come together and come together in a very, very meaningful way. And Diane, on your, you know, on your point, you put it so well. And honestly, Amber, just such a credit to you on the on the, on the TV last night. I mean, for those who don't know, she came to one of my mayoral Q and As and spoke up and drew people's attention to the fact, which actually is frankly scandalous, that over half of our train stations don't have wheelchair uh, access. 2017. You know, this is this is unbelievable state affairs, isn't it? You know, that, that we're kind of basically <coughs> denying so many people the opportunity even to get to, um, to places because they can't access, uh, access the, the transport system. And similarly with buses, not every bus has a ramp on it. You know, we, we, we don't have a, a world here that is, is equal in the way that it allows people to, um, to access it. So, you know, she's so brave, really, in what, in what she said. But what you're pointing to is, a, is, is everything I've been saying today, really, which is a totally different way of supporting people. I don't like this system that makes parents of children with um, complex needs, disabilities, kind of battle every single day. But that's often the reality, isn't it? You know, parents of children with autism tell me this, you know, they, they feel even further behind, you know, in terms of the understanding of what they, what they face. We've got, to, we've got to change it. It's a terrible statistic that here in Greater Manchester, 3% um, of adults with learning disabilities are in work. 3%. National average is 6%. So, you know, we're not as inclusive as we might like to think we are when we have statistics uh, like that. And I'm sure for you as a mum, you will think um, about... Yeah, do it, yeah. That's the message society is sending, isn't it? If you can't equally go with your friends and get a train from the same train station or get access to, to things that they're, they're doing, well, why wouldn't you? You would feel that, wouldn't you? So I, I think you know, what she did was, as you say, gave a voice to, to a lot of people and it gave probably a bit of hope to a lot of people that issues that they care about are being, being addressed. And we, you know, we, we can't put all of that right at, at, a, at a stroke, but. I am absolutely committed to having um, uh, an autism, uh, we're going to have an autism friendly Greater Manchester, we're going to have a, an advisory committee on autism at the top level, we're going to set up a disability advisory group and an access committee at the GM level to put some power behind this kind of call for change. Uh, so we, we, you'll be hearing uh, more from me on, on that. But yeah, and Amber, hopefully it will give a platform for, for Amber to, um, to, to challenge her even more, but she was absolutely right, uh, right to do it. Got a long, let's finish on that point. We've got a long way to go, haven't we? Everything's clearly not, not perfect. We're living through really tough, uh, tough times. Um, you don't need me to tell you that. But as ever, amidst the gloom, we've got a chance to, to do something better, haven't we? And it is, devolution is very true to this place, isn't it? We like to do things differently. Well, devolution is a chance to, to do things differently for our voice to kind of come through at this moment and perhaps inspire other people around the country. And um, let's not let this opportunity slip between our fingers. Everything I've said to you today, I, I feel I'm here because I'm passionate uh, about it. Um, we won't get everything right all the time. It won't all be delivered as quickly as you would like it to be. But I just want you to know as I go away from this today, which has been brilliant, and thanks for your questions. The commitment is genuine. We'll achieve more if we do it, uh, do it together. And uh, the time to do it is now. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>